So our next speaker is Louis Igwe, a Nigerian humanist who will tell us something about atheism and human rights in Africa. So welcome, Louis Igwe. Liebe, glückliche, gottlose Freunde. Fellow atheists, it's a great honor for me to be invited to speak at this convention. Those of us who have been following preparations for this event know that I was not originally slated to be at this meeting. By this time last year, I was in Nigeria going about my job of promoting humanism and free thought. I had no plans of attending this convention. But events in the past few months brought me a train ticket away from this convention. And the organizers were gracious enough to add my name to the list of speakers. So I'm deeply humbled by this opportunity. I'm so delighted to be physically present for the first time at an event organized by Atheist Alliance International. Like many Nigerians, I was born into a Catholic, God-believing, religious home in what I call Nigeria's Bible Belt, that is Southern Nigeria. My parents were traditional religionists, but God forcefully converted to Christianity. My father told me that converting to Christianity was the best way for him to receive an education and get a job. I was born shortly after the Nigerian Civil War at the Biafra end of the conflict. I was not born in a hospital. I was born at the home of a local midwife. I did most of my education in Christian mission schools where I was made to understand that the only moral life one could live was a Christian life. I was made to understand that there was no alternative. No alternative. It is either heaven or hell. It is either you are for God or you are for the devil. I spent the second 12 years of my life in four Catholic seminaries as a student, a teacher, and preacher of the word of God. Dan, are you here? Dan Barker? Okay. <laughs> Good. So. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> so during those years, I studied to become a priest. I taught students what I did not understand. And I preached to people what I never believed in. Because I was told to preach that. I preached that because I was told to preach that. Because that's the only way you can move from one level to the other. That's the only way you will move, you get yourself ordained. Yes, go and preach, even if you don't believe in it. I found the God idea hollow and the cup of prayer empty and meaningless. You pray, you wake up in the morning. You still don't pray, you wake up in the morning. What's the difference? <laughs> I found religion to be a manipulative device employed by clerics and politicians to exploit and tyrannize over the lives of unthinking people. I was disturbed by the prospect of spending the rest of my life propagating these lies and the deception of religion. I felt like I was being held hostage, that I was living in bondage. Three years to my ordination, that was in 1994, I went to my local bishop and told him, my lord, that's the way we address the bishops, I would like to go and think. Friends, I meant it. I wanted to go and think. Because there was no thinking space 
in the seminary. There was no thinking space within the world of religion. It's faith, belief, don't question. I wanted to think, I wanted to question. Well, he granted my request. If he had not done that, I would have walked away. Some priests and friends persuaded me to stay back. They urged me to keep praying, that maybe I wasn't praying hard enough, you know, that I should keep praying. But I felt it was an exercise in futility and self-delusion. So friends, here I am today, still thinking. I have not gone back. I went from thinking to founding a free thought group. Organizing a free thought group in my country was like a frightful, a dangerous undertaking. Yeah, you can say you're a free thinker, but now coming out in the open to say you're a free thinker was another thing. People felt it was risky, it was dangerous. My family members and friends, they never gave me a chance. They thought I would just get burnt out, get frustrated, and abandon the project. Or that I'll be killed by fanatics. But that has not happened. Even though I have faced dangers and been subjected to life-threatening situations, friends, I can tell you today that I'm deeply convinced now, more than ever, of the liberating and enlightening prospects and potentials of atheism and free thought in Africa. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Atheist Alliance International, atheists, free thought groups, and activists around the world for the support they have given me over the years. I came in contact with AI in the course of trying to connect with sister organizations that could help me grow our local free thought group, the Nigerian Humanist Movement. My thought was that I needed the support, experience, and assistance of like-minded groups to found a formidable organization that will stand the test of time. The Nigerian Humanist Movement joined the Atheist Alliance in 2002. So this year marks 10 years of affiliation and association with the Atheist Alliance. NHM was the first African group to join this alliance. And since then, we have enjoyed the support of this organization, and that has made us stronger, more active, and more effective. In the last decade, NHM has received two awards, the Free Dunker Award and the Community Corporation Award. I sat for some years in the board and council of Atheist Alliance International and had the opportunity of working with some of the most brilliant minds in our community. I can still recall vividly hosting AI former president Bobby Kikart and our late friend Harvey in Nigeria in 2004, and also working with Bobby and subsequent AI leaders to support the growth of free thought groups and activism in African countries. I'm glad today that those efforts are yielding fruits and that AI now has a growing network of free thought groups, activists, and projects in the region from Uganda to Malawi. From Gambia, Ghana, to Kenya. Still, dear friends, there's a lot of work to be done. Atheism is still a taboo in many countries. Atheists are not accepted or treated with respect in most families and communities. The dream of a secular world continues to elude many people across the region. Millions of people Thieves and atheists continue to suffer and are abused due to superstition and supernaturalism. Too many atrocities are being committed with impunity in the name of God, Allah, and other constructs which have, over the years, been identified or associated with the so-called supreme being. And I want to devote my speech to two of such areas. The rights of non-believers. Friends, I have had it proclaimed at the UN that the rights of women are human rights. I have also had it proclaimed at the UN that the rights of gay people are human rights. These proclamations change the way human rights are perceived around the world. I want to see it proclaimed at the UN 
at the EU, other regional and national human rights bodies, that the rights of atheists, agnostics, and free thinkers are human rights. I do not want the human rights of atheists to be implied or assumed as currently the case. I want it to be expressly declared that the rights of those who do not profess any religion or believe in God, or those who are critical of religious views are human rights. Why? Because in spite of the progress the world has made in terms of upholding human rights and liberties, and getting states to honor their obligations under various instruments and mechanisms, equal rights have yet to be extended to religious non-believers in most parts of the world. I still do, do, do not know any country in Africa where one can openly and truly say that the government recognizes the full rights of non-believers, including their right to life, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, freedom from torture, inhuman, and degrading treatment. There is no country in the region with an effective mechanism to protect the rights of those who profess no religion, those who change their religion, or those who are critical of religious and theistic ideas. Religious non-believers are treated as if they are not human beings, as if they do not exist or do not have the right to exist. Friends, in Africa, Atheism is invisible, not because there are no atheists, not because there are no free thinkers. There are, but because there is no dignified space, no human space for atheists to be, to exist, or to operate. There are no guarantees for the rights and, and dignity of infidels, apostates, blasphemers, as free thinkers are often called. And sometimes I ask myself, who is really a blasphemer? The person who will teach that their prophet rocketed into heaven in a horse? <laughs> is that a person who is blaspheming? Who? Or the person who says, hold on, a horse, can a horse fly? <laughs> Many governments have caved in to pressures from religious fanatics from theocrats, jihadists, and terrorists. So non-believers are denied their basic rights with impunity, sometimes as a matter of state policy or for the sake of public order, peace, and morality. Yeah, the peace is not for free thinkers. Public morality is not for us. We have to be in jail, we have to be persecuted in order to protect and enhance public peace and morality. Something is wrong somewhere, as far as I'm concerned. The situation is worse in countries with an official religion, official religions, like in Algeria. Yes, officially, if you are born, you are, born, you are, an Islam, you are a Muslim in Algeria. Still, in their constitution, they have freedom of religion. I told them, I said, how can you have freedom of religion when the state church is Islam? You can't see the contradiction? They can't, because Freedom of religion means a different thing to them. Unbelievers are targets of false conversion, oppression, discrimination, persecution, and murder, sometimes by the states. Many governments pay lip service to freedom of religion or belief. Freedom of religion is understood as freedom to profess a religion, the religion sanctioned by the state, by one's family or community, not freedom to change one's religion, or freedom not to profess any religion at all, as contained in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So persecution of non-believers is the norm in most countries. So most people who do not profess any religion in Africa are compelled to leave and remain in the closet, or to pretend to be religious, paying lip service to religions they do not truly profess or to a God they do not actually believe in. Non-believers live in constant fear of their lives because going open with one's religious unbelief often comes at a price, at a very heavy price. In Africa, by going open and public, 
as a free thinker, one risk being ostracized by families and communities, being persecuted by state and non-state agents, being expelled from schools, or being killed by fanatics who are looking for a short court to paradise. As an atheist, one can be sacked from jobs, domestically abused, disqualified from posts, demonized by faith groups, taunted as a person without morality or portrayed as the enemy of the state or society. In many African states, apostasy and blasphemy are crimes punishable by death and imprisonment. Expressions of free thinkers are often taken to be blasphemies. Hence, free thinkers are legally denied freedom of expression. Free thinkers are treated as criminals, not citizens, as undeserving of human rights protection. Atheism cannot be visible in a situation where the human rights of atheists are not guaranteed. Atheism cannot be vibrant in a situation where to be openly and publicly an atheist or to renounce one's faith in God or Allah is like signing one's execution order or death warrant, as is currently the case in Muslim communities. And no atheists want to die, want to do that. After all, the gods are not there to indemnify us. Friends, we all know that the term non-believer does not only refer to someone who, who does not profess a religion or who does not believe in God. In multi-religious societies, non-believers often refer to those who profess other religions or to religious minorities. And we need to be aware of that. So protecting the rights of non-believers is critical to upholding the equal rights of all individuals to freedom of conscience. In fact, show me a country where the rights of non-believers are not protected. I'll show you another country where the right to freedom of religion the rights of religious minorities, in fact, universal human rights are not respected. So we need to get the world to break the criminal silence over the violations of human rights of non-believers. At the UN, EU, Commonwealth, we must strive to get states to recognize and take measures to protect the rights of atheists, skeptics, free thinkers, religious dissenters, and infidels. We must ensure that states that violate the human rights of non-believers or governments that fail to protect the rights of non-believers are held accountable and responsible. Atheists in Africa are looking to Atheist Alliance International to champion their cause and to draw the attention of the civilized world to their plight and predicament. Human rights abuses in the name of religion and God. Friends, these abuses are so many and they have been going on for so long. Human rights abuses in the name of religion are as old as religion itself. Sadly, due to fear of offending religious sentiments, you know, that is, that is the way it is. Nobody wants to offend religious sentiments because when you offend religious sentiments, we die. They will kill us. States and human rights institutions have failed to rise up to the challenge of addressing these abuses. Many people are afraid of shining the light on faith-related human rights violations because of fear of being attacked or killed by fanatics. Highlighting the abuses is often deemed to be offensive or a form of provocation. And our governments do not want to offend or be seen to be offending the religious sentiments or sensibilities of fanatics even when it means condoning grave human rights abuses. Hence, these violations persist. Who will address them? Who? What we have in many parts of Africa and the world is a situation where the victims, not perpetrators, are blamed for abuses, or a situation where harmful traditional practices are encouraged or condoned, because doing otherwise will offend the religious sentiments of the people. For instance, in Mali, the government was forced to shelve a reformed family code legislation that guaranteed gender equity and fairness following threats and opposition from Islamic fanatics. 
religious doctrines, traditions, and sensibilities are cited to justify child marriage. In Nigeria, a Muslim leader came that he had the right to give out the child for marriage at any age he wanted. Yeah, and nobody said anything. Recently, the sh a Sharia state in the north arranged marriage for women. They announced and brought women. Some women came out and they brought some men. They said, okay, they married them. And they told them that if they had to divorce, they need permission from the Sharia police. Yeah, so that's the kind of situation we find ourselves. And nobody will condemn or criticize that because it's Islam. It's Islam, it's Sharia. If you say it, they will, they will, they will kill you. So we have to shut up and live under the dark age, whatever it is. <laughs> Death penalty, corporal punishment, female genital mutilation, the denial of reproductive rights, homophobia, witch hunts, the subordination of women. Yes, this is Burkina Faso. And these are women living in camps in Burkina Faso in Ouagadougou. They committed no offense. As you are, if women are growing old, you're living alone, you're poor, your children have gone out, they suspect them to be witches. You know what they call them? Soul eaters. Manjou's dam. If people die in the community, they say, oh, that woman that has refused to die has eaten the soul. So these women are driven out and are living in camps in Ouagadougou. They're living in camps in Ghana. And many, in many of such informal camps across the region. Even when there are enabling laws, governments lack the political will to enforce these laws. In Malawi, witchcraft accusation is a crime. But when people are taken to court, the person that, is, the person that accuses will be set free. The person that is accused will be jailed. Religious believers and non-believers around the world are looking up to Atheist Alliance International for help in addressing these abuses. But I must say that AI is already doing that by speaking out and supporting our atheist friend, Alexander Ayan, persecuted in Indonesia. We must send a strong message to the government of Indonesia and to other countries where non-believers are persecuted that AI is watching. We need to let them know their human rights obligations to the citizens, and that if they fail to uphold these obligations, they will be held accountable. AI must not only stand up for the rights of atheists and free thinkers around the globe, but also for the human rights of all who are oppressed in the name of religion or God. There are many, far too many around the world who are victims of religious tyranny, violence, and exploitation. We cannot afford to look away or turn a blind eye on the situation because they are not free thinkers. That is not in accordance of our vision of realizing a secular world, is it? We must strive to assure all who are persecuted due to religious supernatural or superstitious belief in Africa or anywhere around the world whether they are believers or not, that they have a friend in Atheist Alliance International. They could be writers or artists whose works and publications offend fanatics. They could be women, children, elderly persons who are persecuted in the name of witchcraft in Africa. Now, the little girl there is Esther. Esther was driven out by the, by the father. The mother is late because the father accused her of killing the mother. And this man saw Esther in the market, local market, and took her. Yeah, because she was vulnerable and all that, took her. And this man is having sex with this girl. So they alerted us when we were in the community, and we went and rescued Esther. She's in a private home now where she's being taken care of. <laughs> Friends, it could also be the Sri Lankan woman arrested recently 
And who could be beheaded in Saudi Arabia for an imaginary offense of witchcraft? It could be the albinos and disabled persons hunted and killed for ritual purposes. Does this believe that, that the body of albinos? Albinos, they need care. They don't need cruelty. And we need to care for them. And we need all of them who are persecuted to understand that there is an organization that cares for them, there's a group of people that cares for them, and that is the atheists and the free thinking people. <laughs> Millions of people across Africa and the world are looking to Atheist Alliance, to the Free Thought Group, for support. I went to communities. Nobody is ready to rescue children accused of witchcraft. Police officers are not ready. Child welfare centers, they don't want to take the children. I took them to the, a, a, a local family home. I took some children to a local family home. The woman in charge said, ah, look, Miss Igwe, you should know that these children have confessed to be witches. I said, yes, uh-huh. When they confess to be witches, what do we do? We should drive them away. Children who do not know they are left from their right, they are confessing to be witches. If you ask them, what is witchcraft? They'll be saying something incomprehensible. So I told them, I said, look, these children are still growing. Let's take care of them first. But they're afraid. And even if you take them to child care centers, they will tell you, please, don't tell others that these, are, these children confess to be witches. Because they will be discriminated against there. So friends, many organizations are looking up to, are looking to organizations, individuals, activists, movements like our own for help and support. So we atheists have once again found ourselves at a defining moment in human history. We have found ourselves trusted with a lot of responsibilities. I am aware that we have very limited resources at the Free Thought Movement, at the DC Alliance International. But I urge you all to join hands. Let's reposition our Free Thought Group, our Free Thought Movement, locally and internationally, so that we can help herald a new dawn for humanity, and once again, a new enlightenment with a global dimension. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. When you mentioned witchcraft in Africa, this is time to remember a proud woman of Cologne, Katharina Herod, who was burnt alive in 1631. She was a postmaster, and a nun visited her in the post office. And the nun sneezed twice. She thought that uh, this woman has cast a spell on her. So, Katharina was accused of witchcraft and then burnt alive after five years of trial. But Katharina was not alone. According to Harvard University, more than 100,000 German women were persecuted for witchcraft. Out of these, 50,000 were burnt alive or drowned. You have taken a very timely step of informing the world of this new menace of new medieval ages in Asia and Africa. We must remember each one of 50,000 German women who were burnt alive, and we must make sure that this doesn't happen again in Europe, in Asia or Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speak. I would like to know other experiences in working together with Amnesty International or other big NGOs? Yes, I've been working with Amnesty International and their frontline human rights defenders based in Ireland. There's another side of the work because, um, like last year, um, I was arrested <laughs> yeah, by police officers and um, because there was this tension in one part of Nigeria where the government doesn't want anybody to give it negative publicity. Yeah. 
Because telling the world that children have been thrown, showing these pictures to the world, all we are giving us, they want positive publicity, even if something negative is happening. You get it? So, and it's difficult. You go, you, you just have, don't have to publicize this. So there was this tension between the government and non-governmental organizations. So there was some kind of clamp down. So last year, yeah, just, we, should, we finished uh, rescuing some of the children and um, got arrested and, um, and all that. So they took us up, they said we're kidnappers and all that. So uh, we got beaten up and, um, and all that. So I was detained, I was kept for two, two, two nights in a room uh, with 50 people. You sleep there, you defecate there, you need it there. And all. So, um, so we have this tension. So, and sometimes Amnesty International has been useful in helping you know, draw the attention of the world to some of this stuff. So I think they were very helpful. And um, also last year, my father was attacked by some people. And um, they beat him up. They hit him with a stone, one of the eyes. And, and we had to eviscerate, you know, we had to remove the eye. Nobody knew exactly who did that, you know, because in my country, there's so many people, criminally minded people and all that, so they want to do something. So it was difficult for us to know who did that because they came around 11 p.m. and I was living in another part. My parents were living in another part. So, uh, so with that, I've, Amnesty International has been very helpful. They were all helpful and they have also been very helpful in uh, trying to draw the attention of the world, send petitions to the government and things like that. So. I've been working with them, and they have been helping in their own way. So you would suggest they are good cooperational partners in, yeah. in fighting? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right. Of course, they don't want to be seen. You know, there's a problem with religion-oriented, yeah. uh, religion-oriented abuses. Because when you want to say, they say, oh, you're against us. You're against African culture. Mm -hmm. You don't want to recall. So there's a problem there. So they, they're treading carefully. Well. I don't want to get into that because I don't want to spend my life criticizing every group. You know, any group I can work with, you know, within the limits, I work with them. I, I was I was discussing with UNICEF. UNICEF said, "Oh, we still want to respect African culture. What is culture? Culture is you you drag a child, you drive a child to the market, and you call the child witchcraft. That is culture." I told that guy, "Do you understand what you mean by culture? These guys sometimes are ignorant." And they want to keep their job at the expense of even their goal, the goal they set out for themselves. <laughs> yes. I was, I was so furious. And I'm still very furious when I remember that argument. It is not our culture. Abusing children is not our culture. Period. So that is a problem. And you see, uh, I, there's a way you do it. Either they think that, oh, because he's an atheist. Or, you know, he's a, he's a militant or whatever, you're a fanatic. Or they say you're a fundamentalist. They have a way of calling you names. But I don't care. I don't care. Call me whatever name. So that is, that is the issue. And also there is this nice, you know, Europeans want to be nice. You know, let's, let's be nice to Africans. You know, I respect them. And don't be nice to us. <laughs> Period. Well, um, I have a question. Uh, to what extent does the missionary work that the Catholic Church is doing in Africa, how does it impact the situation that's already there? And at the same time, the Catholic Church being the biggest charity in the world, I assume they also do a lot of charity and humanitarian work, which the people I appreciate, I guess. So how does that come into with all the things you described? And I assume it doesn't help, but how, how do you deal with that? Well, I appeared before a commission in Ibom State, where we have all much of the problems, with a Catholic priest. And uh, the commissioners, they asked the priest, do you believe in witchcraft? <laughs> Guess his reply. You know, I, I was brought up in the Catholic Church, so I know they can always say no and yes at the same time. Listen to his reply. <laughs> he said, as an individual, no. As a church, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I never like. As individuals, there are different things. When they get to the pulpit, they preach a different thing. And you, you, you can't put them together. Like Dan was talking about. As individuals, they're here. In the pulpit, they're here. You say, Who, where are you? Where are you exactly? They're in both places. That's a problem. If I tell you now that part of the problem, this priest will say no. After all, I don't believe in witchcraft. You see, so that is it. You see, they are part of the problem. 
Let me tell you. Any supernaturally informed organization is part of the problem. Whether it's Catholic Church, Muslim, whatever you call it. They are part of the problem and we have to tell them that. We have to tell them that you are part of the problem. Yes, if you can't tell them, I will. <laughs> I would like to spread this information about the abusing of the children a bit more. And um, can you give me um, a hint, uh, maybe a link in the internet where can I get more information about this abusing of children and um, accusing them of having witchcraft and this stuff? Yeah, well, first of all, um, Stepping Stones Nigeria is a UK based NGO. They've done a lot of work in that area. Now, listen. I'm talking like a teacher, sorry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> many people came to this. They came and saw it. But somebody came, he saw it, he said, never. And that's Gary Foscroft. I told him, people earn my respect. I don't respect anybody. You earn it. He earned my respect. Because he went to that community, he saw that tragic situation. And he went, he started an NGO, they raised money, they've been helping. I've worked with them in doing the public enlightenment. I think that that is the first place. Of course, on the IHU website, you have some, and these are just reports of what we've been doing. But I think Stepping Stones Nigeria will give you all the information you need. The thing is just tip, the tip of the iceberg, the tip, that's what we have seen. It's still going on now. In fact, somebody organized a crusade there uh, in March. What was the title? Uh, the witch must die. The same state where I traveled, I traveled to 31 local communities, talking, preaching. Yeah, I, I'm not preaching reason. I'm not more preaching the word of God. I'm not, pre I'm not preaching the word of reason. Huh? <laughs> so we were going from community to community, telling people. Still, somebody went to the same community to organize um, a crusade. But I also have to say this. There's a woman, of course, some who have been following my word. There's a woman called Helen Opabio. This woman is a disaster. Yes, it's a disaster. She's a criminal. People, everybody fears her. Actually, I don't fear her. Because I know she's an ignorant woman. I know she's not a student of history. She never read, she doesn't, she never read anything about Europe and what happened here. She didn't know that history is not on her side. So that is it. So, and I, I was happy that many friends in the US stopped her because she wanted to organize her witch hunting. She wanted to bring it to the US and deliver US children possessed of witchcraft. And I must say that Bill, Bill Mayer, I think, Am I correct? Bill, you are here? PZ Mayor. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's like I've mixed the name up. Am I correct? Yes, correct? Yeah. Mayor was one of those that did the writing on the blog. Many other free thought groups joined. And we were able to stop her from bringing this disease from Nigeria to the US. So these are also some of the things we can do. Whenever we see it happening, we have to pull the plugs and make sure that it doesn't take place. One of the first things that um, Joseph Ratzinger did when he became the Pope was starting the training of several thousands of exorcists. Do you see a direct connection between that tendency in the Catholic Church and the witch hunts in Nigeria, or are these two different things? They are one and the same. Exorcist, what is your work? What I mean, are you exorcising? Are, are these people from the Catholic Church active in Nigeria, participating in these witch hunts? They are active in Catholic Church because in Nigeria, church is a free market thing. Everybody sets up. If you read about the church in Nigeria, you just wake up, you use your garage where you park your car, you use it as a, as a church. 
you use your living room or what do you call it, parlor, anywhere there's a space, an uncompleted building, you, you convert it to a church and you start doing miracles and start delivering witches and wizards, you know, and start speaking in tongues. So exorcism, when you are saying it, you are, you are restricting it to the church, it's just, it cuts across all the religions. And that's what they're doing now. Everything is demon. Poverty, demon. Marriage failure, everything. Unemployment is demon. So there are demons. Nigeria is filled with demons. Africa is filled with demons. And Africa is also filled with exorcism. Exorcists. So they have a lot of work to do. And that is, that's part of the tragic situation. Thank you very much for this uh, really impressive uh, talk.